Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is March 9th, 2023. This video is called Christ's Letter to the Church in Pergamum. I've done several videos about the letters of Christ to the churches. And I believe that these were specific churches that existed at the time that the book of Revelation was written. Um, but I believe that they are also types of churches. Um, that they prophetically speak about the various churches that have existed throughout the entire church age that has now lasted for 2,000 years. And so Pergamum is a church that... There's two main characteristics about Pergamum that we need to understand and pay attention to. First, it's a church of the prophetic. And second, it's a church of the clergy-laity distinction. And most churches these days, um, if not all, are have the clergy-laity distinction, where certain people are considered to be the clergy and the others are just there to listen and get all of their spiritual understanding from the one or two pastors and teachers of the church. Let's read what Jesus says to the church in Pergamum. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. The word of God. This is the two-edged sword is the word of God. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. The first thing to see here is that this is a church in which there are true believers. Believers who actually stand strong in the midst of persecution. And so that's a very positive, a very good thing. And so Jesus has some positive things to say about the church, but now we're going to move into the things that he says that are not positive. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. Who is Balaam? Oh, we need to see. So let's go to the book of Numbers, chapter 22 of Numbers. Then the people of Israel set out and camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan at Jericho. Moab was one of the sons of Lot. And Balak, or Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was in great dread of the people because they were many. Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, This horde will now lick up all that is around us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, the son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at the time, sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, at Pethor, which is near the river, in the land of the people of Ammah, to call him, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth, and they are dwelling opposite me. Come now, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their hand. Well, we see that Moab and Midian are two nations that are um, very close to each other. Midian was one of the sons of Abraham that he had with his second wife. And they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight, 
and I will bring back word to you as I am speaks to me. So the principles, so the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. And God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Behold, a people has come, come out of Egypt, and it covers the face of the earth. Now come, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to fight against them and drive them out. God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Go to your own land, for I am has refused to let me go with you. So the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Well, if that was all the story, then Balaam wouldn't have been mentioned in the book of Revelation. Next verse, 15. Once again, Balak sent princes, more in number and more honorable than these. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus say, says Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will surely do you great honor, and whatever you say to me I will do. Come, curse this people for me. But Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of I am, my God, to do less or more. So you too, please stay here tonight, that I may know what more I am will say to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, rise, go with them, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the princes of Moab. This is where we see Balaam's first mistake. What was that mistake? God had clearly told him, do not go with them. You shall not curse them, for they are blessed. But here, later, these princes show up promising to give Balaam lots of money. And so Balaam, hoping that God would change his mind, goes back to God to ask him for permission to go. And why does Balaam want to go? He wants to go in order to make money. He already knows God's answer. He already knows what God thinks of this people, that he is being hired to curse. And yet Balaam goes back to God, hoping that God will change his mind and allow him to go make some money by cursing this people. And that's not all, as we will find out. Verse 22. But God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of I am took his stand in the way as his adversary. Now he was riding on the donkey, and his two servants were with him. And the donkey saw the angel of I am standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn her into the road. Then the angel of I am stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. And when the donkey saw the angel of I am, she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of I am went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or the left. When the donkey saw the angel of I am, she lay down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then I am opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you've made a fool of me. I wish I had a sword in my hand, then I would kill you. And the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey, on which you have ridden all your life to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? And he said, No. Then I am opened the eyes of Balaam. And he saw the angel of I am standing in the way 
and his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed down and fell on his face. And the angel of I am said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to oppose you because your way is perverse before me. Your way is perverse before me. And in the book of Revelation, the church in Pergamum, Jesus says, I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam. Their way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me. I'm back in numbers now. The donkey saw me and turned aside before me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely, just now I would have killed you and let her live. Then Balaam said to the angel of I am, I have sinned, for I did not know that you stood in the road against me. Now, therefore, if it is evil in your sight, I will turn back. And the angel of I am said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only the words that I tell you. So Balaam went on with the princes of Balak. When Balak heard that Balaam had come, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab on the border formed by the Arnon at the extremity of the border. And Balak said to Balaam, Did I not send you to call you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? Balaam said to Balak, Behold, I have come to you. Have I now any power of my own to speak anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that I, must I speak. Then Balaam went with Balak, and they came to Kiriath Huzoth. And Balak sacrificed oxen and sheep and sent for Balaam and for the princes who were with him. And in the morning, Balak took Balaam and brought him up to Bamoth Baal. From there, he saw a fraction of the people. Then we move to chapter 23, where Balaam then begins to prophesy over the people of Israel. And he blesses them. In verse 11, Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and behold, you have done nothing but bless them. And Balaam answered and said, Must I not take care to speak what I am puts in my mouth? Then after that, we have the second oracle, which again was a blessing. And then, chapter 24, we have Balaam's third oracle. Another blessing, chapter or verse 10 and chapter 24 of Numbers. Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he struck his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, and behold, you have blessed them these three times. Therefore now flee to your own place. I said I would certainly honor you, but I am has held you back from honor. And Balaam said to Balak, Did I not tell your messengers whom you sent to me? If Balak should give me his house full of silver and gold, I would not be able to go beyond the word of I am to do either good or bad of my own will. What I am speaks, that will I speak. And now behold, I am going to my people. Come. I will let you know what this people will do to your people in the latter days. And then Balaam speaks a final prophecy, which ends chapter 24. And then we go, we don't hear anything out. Actually, the last verse in 24 says, Then Balaam rose and went back to his place, and Balak also went his way. And then verse or chapter 25 of Numbers begins, and it says this, while Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. Now remember, it was Moab, the king of Moab, Balak, who asked Balaam to come. So Israel began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to, sac to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of I am was kindled against Israel, and I am said to Moses, Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before I am, that the fierce anger 
of I am may turn away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you kill those of his men who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel. So it wasn't just the daughters of Moab. We have the daughters of Midian coming too and tempting the men of Israel. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, when he saw this Israelite come in with the Midianite woman, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Thus the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. Now we still, we really don't know what the sin of Balaam is yet, do we? Well, let's go to Numbers chapter 31. I, <clears throat> I am spoke to Moses, saying, Avenge the people of Israel on the Midianites. Afterward you shall be gathered to your people. So Moses spoke to the people, saying, Arm men from among you for the war, that they may go against Midian to execute I am's vengeance on Midian. You shall send a thousand from each of the tribes of Israel to the war. So there were provided out of the thousands of Israel a thousand from each tribe, twelve thousand armed for war. And Moses sent them to the war a thousand from each tribe, together with Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, with the vessels of the sanctuary and the trumpets for the alarm in his hand. They warred against Midian as the Lord commanded Moses and killed every male. They killed the kings of Midian with the rest of their slain, Evi, Rechem, Zur, Hur, and Reba, the five kings of Midian. And they also killed Balaam, the son of Beor, with the sword. And the people of Israel took captive the women of Midian and their little ones, and they took as plunder all their cattle, their flocks, and all their goods. All their cities and the places where they lived and all their encampments they burned with fire and took all the spoil and all the plunder, both of man and of beast. Then they brought the captives and the plunder and the spoil to Moses and to Eleazar the priest and to the congregation of the people of Israel at the camp on the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho. Moses and Eleazar the priest and all the chiefs of the congregation went to meet them outside the camp. And Moses was angry with the officers of the army, the commanders of thousands and the commanders of hundreds who had come from service in the war. Moses said to them, Have you let all the women live? Behold, these, on Balaam's advice, caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against I Am in the incident of Peor. And so the plague came among the congregation of I Am. Now, therefore, kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman who is known man by lying with him. Well, that's why we read the scripture to understand what God means by things. So now we find that even though Balaam blessed Israel four times. He didn't just leave after that and, and give up his reward. There had to be a little meeting, didn't there, between he and Balak and said, you know, I, I couldn't, I could only speak the word that God gave me, but let me tell you how to get around that. Let me tell you how you can still curse and destroy Israel. So then he counseled Balak to use his women to tempt the men into sexual immorality and into idolatry. 
So that's what the sin of Balaam is. And that's why God said to him, your way is perverse before me. Yes, I have anointed you with a spiritual gift of prophecy. But your heart is not for me. Your heart is not for the truth and the justice and the righteousness of God. You have a perverted heart that lusts for money, that lusts for fame, that lusts for things that are not of the will of God. So that's the sin of Balaam. But there's more. Let's go to the book of Jude. Because Jude, you see, speaks specifically to the Christian pastors, the Christian prophets, the Christian leaders who walk in the way of Balaam. Jude is one chapter long. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, so evidently a brother of Jesus. To those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, remember, Jesus died for all. So that sacrifice of Christ is the common salvation for all men. It applies to all men. I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. This is the obedience of faith. This is what we have to walk in in order to save our souls. We must work out our salvation, the salvation of our soul in fear and trembling. Verse 4, for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. The word deny here means contradict. See, people crept into the church even at this time, which was before the year 100. That quickly, we had people coming into the church, ungodly people. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Isn't that interesting? It's Jesus who led the people out of Egypt. Jesus is the God I am that you see in the Old Testament. He is the one who stood in front of the rock the first time when he told Moses to strike the rock. It was, it was showing Jesus being stricken for our sins. And then the second time Moses struck the rock twice and Jesus will not be crucified twice and will not die twice. And that's why Moses could not go into the promised land. Moses was an overcomer. That was a parable and a type, a, a lesson for us to understand that we need to continue in the faith, the one faith that believes in the one crucifixion of Jesus our Lord. And Jesus, he saved a people out of the land of Egypt, but afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Well, we just read that 24,000 people were destroyed by plague when Israel followed the Moabite and Midianite women into sin and into idolatry. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. This is talking about the beginning, um, Genesis chapter 6, when the sons of God saw that the women were beautiful and they left their own domain. 
just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of everlasting fire, or age-lasting fire. The word eternal that we see in Scripture so often is the word age, eon. It's a, uh, a, an undefined period of time. It does not mean forever and ever, but a certain period of time. Yet in like manner, these people also, which people? The people, he said, have crept in unnoticed into the church. In like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, so prophetic gifting, relying on their dreams, relying on their visions, relying upon their prophetic words, relying upon their claim to some spiritual hierarchy that you just, you, you're just not there. But they are. You know, and they don't mind telling you and they don't mind keeping you in your place because they're also Nicolaitans. Because they are up here, but you're here, you're down here. And so you, you need to listen to them because they're more spiritual than you. Do you understand? In like manner, these people, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. Who are they? The glorious ones. We're told. Next verse, verse 9. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, contending with Satan, was disputing about the body of Moses, that's a glorious one, the devil, Satan. When the archangel Michael, contending with the devil was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, I am rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. But what, what do we hear? What do we learn in our charismatic churches, our churches of prophecy and spiritual gifts? I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. It's not what Michael did. Michael did not presume to rebuke Satan. We have people who believe that they're prophetic, who will go railing against all of the glorious ones as if that's doing anything, as if they're calling them down out of heaven and somehow trouncing upon them because they have greater spiritual might than they do. That's ridiculous. It's utterly ridiculous. You've never seen that happen. But these people, these people who have crept in to the church as leaders, these people blaspheme all that they do not understand and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain, the one who murdered his brother Abel, and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error, and perished in Korah's rebellion. So here we see Balaam's error was so that he could gain from it. So certainly Balak paid him money for his good advice on how to defile Israel. These people are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves. False shepherds. Waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, no fruit, no spiritual fruit, no good fruit, twice dead, uprooted. Why twice dead? Because they were dead before Jesus died for their sins, and then now they have lost their souls because... They did not work out their salvation in fear and trembling. 
wild ways of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud-mouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. Showing favoritism. There's always favorites. There's always cliques in these churches, always groups of favorites. They sit on the front rows, and they're buddy-buddy with the Balaams of the church. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life, and have mercy on those who doubt, saving others by snatching them out of the fire, to show to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now, and forever. Amen. So now I think we understand who Balaam is and what the teaching of Balaam is. So back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak, to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. You see, Balaam taught Balak to do that. And for that, Balaam was richly rewarded. That was his gain. So these people... They ate food sacrificed to idols because they actually went to those idols. They actually bowed to Baal, the Baal of Peor. That was the place they were at, Peor, P-E-O-R. And for those of you who listen to my teaching, you understand that spiritually and prophetically food sacrificed to idols is this food is spiritual food we must eat the food of god the body and the blood of jesus the words of god we must wash ourselves with the word of god but if we are perverse before the lord we have idols and then we sacrifice food, we sacrifice doctrine to our idols. That corrupts our doctrine. We are not able to teach truth if we do that. That means we have to take the idols out of our heart. So long as we walk in idolatry, we will sacrifice the truth of God to our idolatry, and therefore we eat food sacrificed to idols. That's what the spiritual meaning of that is. And so Balaam, the teaching of Balaam includes that. So these churches that have, that hold to the teaching of Balaam also have much, much false doctrine because they are sacrificing food to the idols of their heart. 
and they also have sexual immorality in their church. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Now this church, there was a lot of good in this church. Remember, Jesus began by saying, I know you dwell where Satan's throne is. I know you dwell in a hard place. Yet you hold fast my name. And you didn't deny my, <clears throat> deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. So there are good people in this church, people who hold to the faith in the name of Christ. So Jesus is saying here, if, they, if these people who hold to the doctrine of Balaam do not repent, then he will come to them and war against them with the sword of his mouth. That's the word of God. So now, if any of you are listening to this who go to a church like this, you now have a sword that you can war with. Perhaps you can change that church. Perhaps you can get that church walking in the truth and in the ways of God. Or perhaps it's too defiled to save. But you who have heard this word, you now have a sword. You have the sword of Christ's mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We all need spiritual ears. We pray, Father, I pray for ear and ear to hear for those who hear this message. To the one who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give more of my truth, more of my word. And I will give him a white stone. I will give him a diamond ring with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. He will become my bride. We will become one. You will receive a new name just like when a woman gets married to a man and takes the new name from her husband. This is the reward for the overcomers of this church to receive hidden manna, to receive more revelation of the word of God and to become the bride, the bride of Christ.